Okay, so this is my sort of attempt to bring some of the themes of the course together. Of course, can't do everything. It's a very significant amount of material that we've covered, but I just there are some things I want to say about about how to think about how, how I think about these theories of justice. And so, of course, when this is just me. You can just ignore it all if it's if it doesn't gel with um, how you see things. <clears throat> but anyway, this is how I see things. Now, I'm not going to say everything about, I'm not going to give you my theory of justice or anything. I just want to talk about how I see these theories relating to each other. So I, I think the most powerful theory of justice, I'm not saying it's necessarily the right one, but the most, the one that's got the strongest arguments, the one that's hardest to sort of push aside, if you wanted to push it aside, is, is Rawls's. I, I think that Rawls's arguments around the difference principle and around the, um, uh, his intuitive argument for the difference principle and the stuff about the natural talents and so on is extremely powerful and it's extremely powerful for a simple reason i i don't have the faintest idea how one would go about rejecting it i don't i don't, I don't see how you could argue against it i mean people don't deserve their natural talents i think that's pretty clear i mean how could they um so that seems to be to be very strong but it also seems to me that Cohen's got a point when he says that human selfishness can't be used to justify a principle of justice. And I think that Cohen is right to notice that Rawls does use human selfishness to justify the difference principle. R remember how this goes. It, it, remember, the difference principle allows for inequality. Uh, right, it calls for some equality, but only a certain amount. It, it allows some inequality on the basis that people have to be provided with an incentive to work. Otherwise, you know, and the incentive has to be, I'll be better off than other people. Right. Otherwise, they won't be incentivized to work in certain ways, like to become a doctor or whatever. You remember how this argument goes. Um, but, I mean, that seems to be saying because people are selfish um, uh, that the difference principle has the shape that it does. And that's a, it's a curious argument. How can human selfishness be used as a justification for a principle of justice? Uh, there's at least there's an issue there, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and that's true even if the selfishness in question is perfectly understandable and, and even if it's morally excusable in the current environment. You see, there seems to me there's no reason to think that justice could not require that people become better people, right? It may be that justice is, for example, a long, it's not a goal, but it's more of a project. And part of the project will be making people into better people. Um, it might be justice may demand that over time people become better People care about each other more, and so on. And I don't. And that's the Marxist vision, right? Part of the Marxist vision that Cohen is appealing to is that justice requires that people over time become better, care about each other more, are less self-interested, are less self, uh, are less egoistic. I mean, you know, the, the Marxist picture is that capitalism makes people that way. It's not their fault. It's not our fault that today. I mean, we live in a world where people are very self-centered. Um, Marx would say that's not your fault. It's just the way that the economic system forces you to behave, right? But if we change the economic system, then people can ch also change and become different. Now, I'm not saying you have to accept what Marx is saying about that. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. The point I'm making is that it seems there doesn't seem to me any reason why a theory of justice couldn't say yes. That's the way people. This is the way people are now. But people, we want people to change, to be more like this. That's what justice requires. It requires people to become better. That seems to me to be a legitimate goal, a legitimate aim of a theory of justice. Having said that, though, it's one thing to say that justice might have this as part of a project. It's another thing to say that the state has a legitimate role in forcing it to happen. So... <clears throat> We might think that justice might, you know, maybe justice requires people to become better, but we might think that the state has no role in forcing people to become better. So, uh, and indeed, I mean, that's something that I think. 
right? And I think that's actually one of the great tragedies of Marxism, right? The, the tragedies of Marxism is that Marx's followers tried to use the state to make people better. And the result was a complete disaster. Um, but I would argue even more, it's not just that it has bad consequences, it's that if the state tries to do this, the state is acting unjustly. Even if it's trying to achieve something that would be better, if the state tries to force you to be better, what the state is doing is unjust. Okay, now, <clears throat> so I think they might, we can think about it this way. There could be two ways of thinking about justice. We might talk about what we could call perhaps ideal justice and practical justice, where, where practical justice is the kind of justice that we can achieve now or in the not too distant future, given the kind of people that human beings are. Whereas ideal justice would be the kind of justice that we could achieve in the long term if people were able to change in ways that would make them more just as well. And so perhaps what one way to understand this is that what Rawls was doing was trying to do practical justice, the trying to achieve justice now, given the way that people are. But what Marx was doing was trying to achieve ideal justice, right? That is a more long term project where people are able to over time change, become more just people. Now, I say that that might be right. You can you can think this picture is compelling, even if you disagree with Rawls and Marx about the specific contents of of their theories, you might still think that they're onto something here. Okay, <clears throat> so ideal justice, uh, practical justice is about the reality of human beings, and ideal justice is about the potentiality of human beings. Maybe that's a useful way of thinking about it. Um, <clears throat> okay, now the, one of the reasons that this is interesting to me is is that Cohen. Cohen was actually very awake to this problem. Um, Cohen was a socialist. He was a Marxist. Um, um, but he accepted that there was no way that he could see now that socialism could be achieved. He thought that socialism was an ideal from the perspective of justice, but it's not currently possible to achieve it. Maybe, he thought, maybe someday in the future it would be possible to achieve. But right now, it's impossible because he couldn't see how you could motivate people to move in that direction, how you could deal with the problems that socialism throws up. There would have to be some, for example, technological solutions to a bunch of problems that famously exist with socialism about how to produce and distribute resources and so on. Okay, now I... I actually don't agree with Cohen about these things, but, but I generally think that, um, that the general picture that Cohen is operating with is, is a very plausible one and, and an attractive one. And, and that, that is putting aside all the issues about socialism and so on. But the, the point is that um, there may be ideals that we should hold on to even though we can't reach them now, and even though we don't know how we could ever reach them, because maybe one day they'll be possible. But what we mustn't do is wreck everything in the pursuit of impossible goals, as happened in, the, for example, the Soviet Union. But, what, but maybe still we, we need to somehow hold on to ideals that we can't realise now, because maybe as a result of holding on to them, we'll be able to realise them in the future. Right, I think that's and that's an attractive view, I, my view. But I also think that Nozick's right about something very important as well. Um, Nozick's fundamental intuition is that you can't regard everything that a person produces as social property without undermining the value of that person. Um, and I think there's a tendency for people to do that in utilitarianism, in rules in theory, in the world in which we actually live. Um, there's a tendency to regard, I mean, we, you know, I, I think some of our politicians, the way they talk, they talk about wealth as if it was just a social asset that can be distributed in any way the society wants, rather than thinking that wealth is actually stuff that matters to people. Like, I mean, my wealth, is, it isn't just numbers in a bank account. It's this, this place where I live. It's these guitars that I love. It's my car that I care about. It's my clothes that I wear. It's you know, it's this stuff that matters to me, 
right? And if you just treat all this stuff as if it wasn't mine, as if it was just some kind of communal property that could be distributed in any way that we, that we feel justified, then you undermine me as a person. Now, I, I think, now Nozick may have taken that too far, maybe, right? But I think that that's nevertheless a very powerful intuition. It, also, it is also an intuition that Rawls respects, um, because remember that Rawls thinks personal property, and he would include this stuff in personal property, including the house, right? That's my personal property. He thinks that that is protected by the basic liberties principle. Right? <clears throat> but nevertheless, Rawls also thinks that stuff I produce can just be redistributed because, you know, he seems to think that that it's all public property in the end. Okay, and, and Nozick says, you know, we've got to be careful about this because if we do this, we undermine the, the sense that, that, you know, things matter to people. Right? It, maybe they met in our society, maybe they matter more than they should, but they matter to people. I mean, I, I think these, so for example, these guitars are a good example. Um, my, some of my life is tied up in... <laughs> You know, don't want to be melodramatic, but in these things, I play them every day. Um, they matter to me. They, they, I mean, I have no, <laughs> embarrassingly, I have names for them. Um, I'm not a big user of names. I'm not like some people. But, you know, that white Stratocaster over there that you can't see. Yes, you can see. That one there, there is called Sally. And I, I use that's one the one name that really has stuck. Um, it matters to me these things. And if you just said, "Oh well, we'll just take them away and give you another set of c- guitars because we're just redistributing them," that would really damage me. Um, I'd survive, but um, you know, it's you, you can't treat people as property as if it was just fungible in this way. And these things matter to people, and their houses. I mean, that, that really matters to people. Although, of course, no doubt that there's a big issue around houses, particularly in Auckland, right? Um, because it turns out that some people have a lot of them and some people don't have one. And, you know, this creates a huge amount of problems with equality. But we have to be careful about how we deal with with this. I mean, I mean, I don't... Once you've owned one, I think that's enough. If you own more than one... The ju- I mean, this is my my rules in intuition. If you own more than one, the justification for owning the second one can only be the difference principle. That's, but but nevertheless, we can't just treat property as fungible. Okay, all right. Anyway, <clears throat> so I think knows it's right about something. Two, so you know, I think the Marxists right about something. I think Rawls is right about something. I think Nozick's right about something. Um, um. Okay, and and Rawls uh, knows it's right about something even deeper than this too, and we can think about uh, how this connects with Rawls. So remember um, how it works for Rawls. Rawls has this thought experiment that we go into the original position, right, which is we all imagine ourselves in the state of nature. There's no laws, there's no rights, there's no duties, there's no nothing. But we all go along to a constitutional convention and we nut out what the basic principles of our society will be. And one of the principles that we produce is the basic liberties principle. And the basic liberties principle means amongst other things that you're, you know, that we have, um, a, you know, a right to control the use of our own bodies and people aren't allowed to use our bodies in ways to which we don't consent and so on. Now, I think one of the things that knows it would want to say about Rawls's argument is that it gets this wrong because it says that these rights that I have, for example, to my body, my basic liberties are a product of the Constitutional Convention. And Nozick would say, no, they're not. You go into the Constitutional Convention with these rights. Right? You don't come out of the, you come out of the Constitutional Convention with the rights as well, but the, the Constitutional Convention doesn't create the rights. So, it, um, and one way of thinking about this is that when we go, you and I, when we go into the Constitutional Convention, I'm not allowed to beat up on you if you disagree with me. Right? You've already got the right to your body. I'm not allowed to interfere with what we call your right to bodily integrity. I'm not allowed to interfere with that in the Constitutional Convention. right? And that's, that's actually built into the structure of, of Rawls's thought. It's a constitutional convention. It's not a constitutional fight, right? So it's kind of, he's, he's built, without even noticing it, this is another blindness of Rawls, without his even noticing it, he's building in certain rights into the Constitutional Convention in the first place. And Nozick is saying, yeah, that's because we have them in the state of nature. Right? And I think Nozick's right about that. 
Okay, so there are there are some things that predate the political, that pre-exist the political. We have, and that this is essentially Locke's and uh, discovery. Although I think Locke gets nearly everything else. My own view is Locke gets nearly everything else wrong, but um, that there are certain things that that are pre-political about us. And but and for example, that I have a right to control the use of my own body. That's not, in my view, something that's given to me by the political state in which I live. That's something that I have in virtue of the kind of creature that I am. Now, the, my society might not respect it, but if they don't respect it, they're violating my rights. So, so and, and these pre, some of these pre-political rights are rights that we hold against each other as individuals. And this moves us from the topic that we've been talking about to another topic that we're not going to have time to talk about, but that really lies close to my heart. It's what most of my research is about. And that is a different kind of justice. We've been talking about distributive justice so far in, in the course, which is, uh, as we said right at the beginning, justice about how the benefits and burdens of society are distributed. Okay, that's distributive justice. Justice about how the benefits and burdens of society are distributed. But in my view, there's another form of justice that we don't spend nearly enough time talking about. And in fact, we don't really have a very good name for it. The best name, I think, is commutative justice. C-O-M-M-U-T-A-T-I-V-E. Commutative justice. This is a, a commutative is a term that, um, lots, a Latin term that lots of medieval philosophers used. We could call it, it sometimes gets called corrective justice. It sometimes gets called interpersonal justice. There are other names. But it's the justice that exists as between individuals. But distributive justice is about distributing the benefits and burdens of society amongst everyone. Commutative justice is about the justice that exists as between individuals. And I think the private law is largely, or at least the core elements of the private law, is largely about this form of justice. Um, tort law is about what happens if I wrong you. It's not about the state. It's about if I wrong you, what you have, what I have to do to make up that wrong to you. Um, and I think this is, gets left out of the debate, but we start seeing it in Nozick. It's only, you know, with, these other, other philosophers ignore it completely. It's, it's kind of maybe in Locke. We could dispute that. Maybe it's in Locke, but it's not in Hobbes. It's not in the utilitarians. It's not in, certainly not in Bentham or Mill. It's not in Marx. It's it's not in Rawls. But it's kind of there in Nozick. Now he takes this community of justice and applies it to the whole society. And maybe that's taking it too far. Maybe it should just be kept at the interpersonal level. But we shouldn't forget the interpersonal level. My own view is that the interpersonal level is in our lives much more important than the level of the interaction between the individual and the state. And yet almost all our theorizing, almost all our thought is about the individual and the state and hardly any is about the interaction between people. Okay, and if this course was twice as long, which you're probably saying, thank God it isn't, um, what I would do now is I would go on and start talking about interpersonal justice. In fact, there are a whole bunch of people people like Immanuel Kant and Samuel Pufendorf and Thomas Aquinas and others who think that the interpersonal is actually the basis of the political and not the other way around. So we start with the community of justice and we generate distributive justice from there. And that's a view that I happen to find very uh, attractive. It's just one that's very difficult to teach in the relatively short courses that we have. Anyway, this brings us to the end. You know, these piecemeal reflections bring me to the end of the course. We're finished now. Um, I, I, I hope that you found the material somewhat interesting, reasonably interesting, and I, I hope that it continues to be thought-provoking for the rest of your life, that ideas will pop into, you know, you'll hear something on the radio or as you're driving or you'll... You'll see something on your iPad or something, or someone saying something, and you'll think, hang on a minute. Right? And it connects with some ideas that we've 
been discussing and that it's useful not just for getting an exam and getting a degree and so on but it makes you more thoughtful and enriches your life anyway that's my hope all the best <laughs>